Shalom, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, third session of uh, the Finding the Nexus, Where Did the Israelite Encounter God? I just want to say that this amazing title was actually invented by no other than Dr. Scott Stribling, our, our uh, uh, lecturer for today. Uh, and Scott will be lecturing about uh, Shiloh, ancient Shiloh. Uh, we'll say a few words about that, but I just want to uh, say that the first place where I met Scott was actually um, when uh, Scott discovered a uh, second temple a Jewish village in Samaria. And uh, while excavating inside a, an olive press, um, he actually discovered uh, bones of uh, Jewish uh, women that were massacred by the Romans. And uh, these, these bones were given to us, to the, the community of Ofra, to, be, uh, to go through a, a burial procedure, uh, a Jewish burial procedure, which was really an amazing moment. And we erected a, a monument above the, the grave. And uh, since then, Scott and I have been in touch um, about uh, the Shiloh dig, but uh, mainly about Joshua's altar. Uh, that we heard the uh, last uh, last session that Ralph Hawkins uh, gave us a lecture about Joshua's altar. So uh, Scott has been involved in the uh, continual research of Joshua's altar. And uh, as you all know, there is a lot of uh, interesting news going on uh, uh, this week about Joshua's altar. And maybe Scott will be willing to give us uh, uh, some more information that other people don't know about yet. Uh, but that will probably be in the end. So I'll just introduce uh, Dr. Scott. Scott Stripling is the Director of Excavations and Chief Archaeologist at, Shiloh, at Ancient Chilo. Uh, from 2017 present and previously directed the excavations at Khirbet and Makatir from 2013 to 2017. He also served as a field supervisor at the Tel El Hamam excavation project uh, and the Temple Mount sifting project. Stripling's, Stripling earned master's degrees from the University of Texas and the Assemblies of God Theological Seminary and a PhD in archeology span and biblical history from Veritas International University. He serves as a provost, I don't know what that is, as a provost <laughs> uh, and director of the archeological institute at the Bible Seminary in uh, Katy, Texas. Stripling is a popular speaker and author and frequently appears as a scholar in documentaries and popular media programs. His geographical research focus lies in the highlands of Israel across multiple time periods, ranging from the late Bronze Age to the early Islamic period. Stripling's academic articles appear regularly in peer-reviewed journals such as Levant, Palestine Exploration Quarterly and Near East Archaeological Society Bulletin and popular magazines like Kadmoniut and Bible and Spade. Um, and uh, without further ado, uh, Scott, the mic is yours. And uh, after your lecture, we will have a 15 minute Q&A session. Uh, and so I will be muting everyone and uh, um, right now, and Scott, I just uh, asked you to unmute yourself. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Aaron. Appreciate you uh, saying those, those kind words and I value our friendship and collaboration. Thanks to all of you for participating in this Nexus course. I think that it's a, a great topic to consider like where God came down, how humans interface, how celestial and terrestrial interface historically and especially as shown to us through the Hebrew Bible. So I appreciate your interest and um, having excavated in the highlands for a number of years, I wanna share some of my experience and insight with you in particularly about Shiloh, where we've been working tw since 2017. And now we uh, do have a large group, it appears going back this summer to, uh, to excavate with us again. So 
Uh, you can follow along with us this summer at Shiloh Network News through digshiloh.org and uh, keep up with what we're doing. If you happen to be in the country, come by and uh, move some goofus for us or, you know, bring us ice cream or something like that. It would be greatly appreciated. So with no further ado, let's talk about Shiloh. And I will probably interchangeably say Shiloh, Shiloh. Um, in, in English, American English, at least we say Shiloh and the rest of the world says Shiloh. So I'll probably bounce back and forth. Let's see if I can get to the next slide. Okay, let's uh, start in the text itself. Um, Exodus 31 reveals who built the, uh, the tabernacle. And you can see their names here. Then the Lord said to Moses, see, I have chosen Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah, and I have given him, or I filled him with the spirit of God, with wisdom and understanding, with knowledge, with all kinds of skills, uh, to make designs for working gold, silver, and bronze, to cut, and I'm sorry, the uh, part of the text is blocked for me here on the right. Can I minimize the, the folks, Aaron, on the right? so that I can see the full text? Yes, you may. I'm gonna to try to do that. Okay, is that okay? Yeah, to cut and set stones, to work in wood and to engage in all kinds of crafts. Moreover, I have appointed Aholiab, son of Achisamak of the tribe of Dan to help him. I have also given ability to all the skilled workers to make everything I have commanded you. So to start with, we actually know more than maybe we thought about the Mishkan. We know who built it. Um, and so we, here we have a firsthand account, uh, the Lord speaking to Moses. I handpicked these two men, Bezalel and Aholiab, and we're told who their fathers are as well, which is, is kind of interesting. Of course, in those times, sons would normally follow vocationally uh, in their father's footsteps. Exodus 31 continued the tent of meeting the Ark of the Covenant law with the atonement cover on it and all the other furnishings of the tent, the table and all its artic articles, the pure gold lampstand and all its accessories, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils, the basin with its stand, and also the woven garments, both the sacred garments for Aaron the priest and the garments for his sons when they serve as priests, and the anointing oil and fragrant incense for the holy place. They are to make them just as I commanded you. So instructions are given to Moses. He passes these on to Bezalel and uh, to Aholiab, and then they implement them. They build the, uh, the Mishkan and its furnishings. How often things within the Mishkan had to be replenished because they wore out, we just simply don't know. We would have to speculate. I know the, the tabernacle replica down at Timnah in southern Israel, um, which is quite, quite good. Um, they told me that every few months they have to replace some of the awnings and things because of the, the wind blowing. So one would think, apart from a miracle, that perhaps they, they did have to regularly maintain some of the things in the Mishkan. <clears throat> now, what you're looking at is what we call Sinai 375A. And uh, of course, to the untrained eye, this just looks like scratches. But uh, in actuality, if you were to look on the left-hand side of your screen, look closely, you'll see some letters that you may even recognize. You may see um, an ox head, for example, and this is, of course, the early uh, um, Aleph, where the, the ox head is going to morph into the first letter of the uh, Hebrew alphabet. Now, um, Petri is the one who discovered this, by the way, at Sedebet and Hanim down in the Sinai, the ancient turquoise mines, and what we had were Hebrew slaves working in these turquoise mines in the 18th Egyptian dynasty, uh, specifically in the 15th century BC, and uh, Petrie was quite clear early on that there were Semitic writings uh, there in the turquoise mines and even um, incense altars and so forth that were Semitic in their, uh, in their orientation. Now, one of the interpretations of Sinai 375a by Petrovich is that it mentions Ahisamak. And Ahisamak is only known from Exodus and if it is indeed on, on Sinai 375a. So in the next slide, you can see what this looks like. This is Petrovich's reading. 
And um, of course, at this point, we're talking about late Bronze Age 1B and or maybe the late Bronze Age 1B two-way horizon, 1400 BC or, or mid 15th century, actually, at this point. Um, you have no standardization. You have Egyptian hieroglyphs that are morphing into Hebrew letters, Semitic letters, some would say Canaanite, but let's just call it like it is, it's Hebrew. Um, they, they can be read right to left, left to right, um, vertically, horizontally, so there's no standardization. And sometimes even as an ox would plow in the field, like it's going left to right and then coming back, it's right to left and then left to right and so forth, just like you would uh, plow in a field. Now, this is interesting because um, the, the translation is Ahisamak, the keeper of uh, minerals. Um, and if indeed this is, this is what he is, then perhaps our Ahisamak of, of Exodus 38 is the, uh, the son of this man. So maybe we do have a tangible archaeological link here, something for you to at least be aware of and to think about. Now, we know that the tabernacle was erected at Shiloh. The text is, is clear about that. Um, why? We can only speculate why, why Joshua chose uh, Shiloh. And the length of time is somewhat up in the air as well, because from our reading of the Hebrew Bible, if you're reading it inductively, you would, you would come out with a little over three centuries, but then you have a Seder Olam reference to 369 years, and this is what you often hear cited as, you know, it was at Shiloh for 369 years. That's a little problematic to make that 369 years work within the rest of biblical chronology. And so to me, it seems like taking the larger from the Hebrew Bible, the larger date of uh, a little over three centuries is probably more reliable. So you can see what I have here on the screen, something like from 1399 or the beginning of the 14th century. Uh, taking an early date for the Exodus and Conquest, which, which I would, uh, down to about 1094. Let me say just a couple of words about dating, not to, to attempt to persuade you to my point of view, just simply to make sure that everybody's aware of the issues. Um, I was a co-author of a new book published by Zondervan last year entitled Five Views on the Exodus, and I wrote chapter one, and chapter one is the biblical date of the Exodus. And so if you need to explore further all the reasons why I believe that, well, biblically, there's no doubt that that is the date, but I give you the biblical um, reasoning and, and exegesis, and then why the archaeology and my perspectives does support the biblical date. The other chapters essentially are telling you um, why the biblical date is not correct. So um, I, if you want to pursue it further, please get a copy of the book, Five Views um, on the Exodus. And this is, of course, not to say that I'm any better or smarter than any Ralph, you know, talked to you last week, and Ralph is a great friend, and he does hold to a, to a late date. But um, I am confident with the biblical date, and I think that the archaeology supports it, including at Shiloh, which is sort of where we're working our way toward um, but this chronology that I'm looking at, 1399, presupposes a biblical date um, for the Exodus and Conquest, 1446, exit, Exodus uh, 1406, entrance into the land. Now, in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see the dimensions given in the Bible for the Mishkan. This is a little bit challenging also because which cubit are we talking about? Is like the royal Egyptian cubit or is it a later cubit? But it is clear that however you, you, you slice it, it's a two to one ratio. It's 100 by 50 or it's 52 by 26 if you're using uh, meters. So it's uh, ratios of two to one, even within the, the inner sanctuary, um, the holy place as opposed to the most holy place is on a ratio of two to one as well. So uh, keep that in mind as we, we move forward. And here you can see uh, some signage from Shiloh if you visit the site uh, today, which we hope you will this summer. Uh, come and visit us. You can see the uh, wording from the Seder Olam. The sanctuary at Shiloh was built on stone walls covered by tapestries. Israel worshiped in it for 369 years. Then it was destroyed. Um, we do now have evidence of that destruction that I'm going to show you. Uh, as well, which would date to around 1075 uh, BC. 
the Philistine destruction of Shiloh. Now, it's not only the Seder Olam, we have a second source from the Mishnah that also states that there was a permanent platform, if you will, for the tabernacle that was constructed at Shiloh. And that's very consistent with what you would read in 1 Samuel 3, 1 Samuel 4, where you'll see a change in language from temporary language like curtains of the tabernacle. Now, now you're talking in chapter three about the walls of the tabernacle, the door of the delet in Hebrew. So the language is changing from temporary to permanent. And that is supported in this case by the, uh, by the Mishnahic writings. And here is the key text, Joshua 18.1. Um, the whole assembly of the Israelites gathered at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there. The whole country was brought under their control. Now, seven of the tribes had not yet received their land allotments, and so they received those at, at Shiloh. Why did Joshua choose uh, Shiloh? And, and the best we know, Shiloh means... Uh, the equivalent of something like tranquility, like shalom meaning peace, shiloh meaning tranquility. Um, Joshua was from the tribe of, uh, of Ephraim, and, and Shiloh was in Ephraim territory, so perhaps the explanation is as simple as that, that he, he was in charge and he put it in his, his tribal territory. Perhaps it's the ancient patriarchal ties, um, you know, of Ephraim, um, going all the way back to, to the close relationships of the, the patriarchs at Shechem. Um, maybe it's because it was centrally located. This, this is another possibility. I'm going to try to unminimize this without disconnecting anybody. Okay, well, I don't want to take a chance on disconnecting you guys. Um, but one other thing that I want to um, mention is that in the late Bronze Age, we have something called a city-state system of governance. And so we have the Megiddo city-state, the Hatzor city-state, the Jerusalem city-state, the Shechem city-state. And all of these are hostile toward the Israelites except Shechem. And in Joshua, Eight, when the Israelites arrive at Shechem with Mount Gerizim on one side, Manival on the other, the Shechemites do not resist the Israelites. They do not fight the Israelites. They join with them in this covenant renewal ceremony. Remember what the text says, all Israel joined in together, alien and citizen alike. And it seems to me that that is exactly what happens at Shiloh. When Joshua arrives at Shiloh, there's no battle, there's no resistance, even though archaeologically we're positive that it was occupied. But the people of Shiloh appear to me to be in confederation with Shechem. So what I'm getting at is I think that Shiloh is a satellite of the Shechem city-state. And uh, so this is why there is no resistance and perhaps why Joshua chooses uh, that site to erect, to, uh, erect the tabernacle. Now, the, the plot thickens, as we say, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. What you're looking at right now is a portion of the famous Maraba map from St. George's Church in uh, Jordan. And I have published some articles on this. If you go to my academia page, you can uh, access those. But something that we can't resist doing is, of course, looking at ancient maps and trying to, to determine any clues that they might give us as far as site location. And you can see that Shiloh is mentioned prominently uh, on the bottom of the map, uh, written in, in Greek, but uh, translated in the English, Silo, Silo, Silo where the ark stayed. So make no mistake about it, Shiloh matters because the ark was there. Uh, the ark was there, the tabernacle was there, the presence of God was there. Jeremiah 7, 12, um, God says, that's where I first caused my name to dwell. Go now to Shiloh, he told Jeremiah, where I first caused my name to dwell. And uh, so it's because of the ark, it's because of the presence of God, it's because of the sacrificial system that is operated there that Shiloh is important. It's because of that that I'm excavating there. You know, we seem to be, we can sometimes come across as very altruistic and scientific, 
But let's make no mistake about it. The Danish went to Shiloh in 1922, exactly 100 years ago, because the Mishkan was there. Um, Bar Ilan University and Israel Finkelstein leading the dig in 1980 to 1984. They went to Shiloh because the Mishkan had been there. Had it not for that, they would have gone to some other site. Um, I'm there now for that, that very uh, reason. So we're trying to establish a verisimilitude or a consistency between the archaeological data and the biblical text. And so we look at them dispassionately through a criterial screen, like this is what we would expect to find. Do we find these things? And that's not to say that if something is absent that it didn't happen because many things could destroy evidence. You know, clearly you could have a burn and then, you know, heavy wind or rain that follows up and it, maybe you don't have an ash layer, even though there's an indication from the text that there's a burn. But many times the evidence is there. And so we're, we're looking for that correlation. Um, so I don't know if any of you have been to the, the St. George's Church and seen the Madaba map, but uh, quite the interesting study. We also have another ancient map called the Putinger Plates that sometimes we refer to. And who knows in the future what other maps we may find. We found a map of the city of Kirbet el Makatir, which was biblical Ephraim, I believe, um, John 11, 54, that nothing like it has ever been found, but it was just a map of that city itself, not of the region. And that will adorn the cover of Kirbet el Makatir volume two, which will is already in the publisher's hands and will be out uh, for purchase in just the next few months. Okay, now let's talk about the Amarna letters. Um, in particular, a series of these letters written from Abdihiba, the king of Jerusalem. Now, in the Amarna correspondence, we have 382 clay tablets from Tel El Amarna, Egypt, very narrowly dated, of course, because Akhenaten had converted to monotheism. And so, you know, we can date these very narrowly to when the capital was at, uh, at Amarna. And so these begin with Amenhotep the fourth or Akhenaten and, um, and then Amenhotep the third, I'm sorry, maybe a few of them and that are predominantly from Amenhotep the, the, the fourth. So we would date these to around 1370, something like this um, BC. And what we have is the Canaanite city states that I was describing earlier, crying out to Pharaoh for help send us archers or we'll, we won't be able to pay our tribute this, more, this year. The Habiru are everywhere. They're infestations. They're taking over all the cities. Uh, clearly at Shechem, they have, have gone over to the Habiru and um, other cities, Megiddo, they're, they're falling. Only I, Abdihiba king of Jerusalem was saying like, only I am loyal to Pharaoh at this point and I can't guarantee how much longer I'm going to be able to hold out against these Habiru. Well, the, the Habiru, as, as Naman Abigad pos, uh, posited, and I would agree with, uh, are none other than the Hebrews. Um, we have consonants in ancient Hebrew, not vowels. So the Habiru or the HBR, um, I agree with him that the, those are the, the Hebrews. And I believe that they were taking over. Uh, this, of course, only works for the early date of the Exodus and conquest, not for the late date. And I think they were taking over these, these Canaanite uh, cities. And EA 288, El Amarna 288, is one of those letters from Abdikiba. And they're never answered, by the way. Pharaoh never responds to these, to these letters that we know of. Um, maybe he was unwilling or unable, but he is losing his colonies. So when I'm talking about Canaanite city-states, I'm talking about Egyptian vassals. In fact, it's not even fair to refer to them as Canaanite, they are Egyptian, okay? These are Egyptian colonies located in what we normally refer to as Canaan, but I challenge you to read the Amarna correspondence and come away with a different picture. These are Egyptians, uh, just like Cleopatra wasn't a native born Egyptian. She was a Greek, but she was ruling Egypt. And so clearly Egypt is in charge uh, here in the, the late Bronze Age. So EA 288 has a very interesting reference that I want to read to you, and it's in front of you. This is lines 41 through 47. Behold, Turbasu was slain in the city gate of Silu. The king did nothing, 
Behold, servants who were joined to the Habiru smote Zimreda of Likisu, and Yatihada was slain in the city gate of Silu. The king did nothing. Why has he not called them to account? So what we have here is Abdihiba saying, look, this is what's going on. And even at uh, Silu, they're being killed uh, in the city gate. Sh Shiloh being part of the Shechem city state, this, this makes a lot of sense. Now, I want to tell you what the scholarship reads on this and then why I disagree with it. Um, if you read a standard commentary, like Moran has probably the best work on this, Anson Rainey, uh, Albright, um, all wrote on the Amarna letters pretty extensively. They have linked this Silu here in, in 288 to a fort down in Egypt, a border fortress down um, in the Bitter Lakes region of, uh, of Egypt, where some would believe the, the Red Sea crossing was. As Churu, it would be called. Um, in the Egyptian tongue, but the problem with this, friends, is that all other 382 letters are not from Egypt, none of them. They are all from Canaan. If this were true, then this is one out of 382 refers to a fort down in Egypt, which makes no sense to me. Why would a fort in Egypt be an issue here. We're talking about distance and in the colonies. Why other scholars have not picked up on this and linked this to biblical Shiloh, I do not know because it seems clear to me that this has to be a site in Canaan proper and um, it is none other than Shiloh. And of course, the gate of Shiloh is mentioned in the Bible in 1 Samuel 4.18 and in other places. Here we have mentions of the, the gate uh, in this Amarna letter. So I did two programs on this recently, and uh, this is all the time I have to talk about it right now, but I would refer you to YouTube, to the Associates for Biblical Research, our YouTube channel, YouTube Associates for Biblical Research, um, Amarna Letters. If you just type that in, it's two episodes. Uh, you'll be able to see, and you can get all my reasons why I think this, this is actually describing Shiloh. And if, this, if I'm right, then I'm the first one to actually observe this. And now we have a second witness of Shiloh in the Bronze Age besides the biblical text. And perhaps in the Q&A, uh, some of you may have questions or comments on that. Okay, now you're looking at our drawing. After three seasons of excavation, this is field H1. The big fortification wall, what's labeled as Wall one, MB city wall is 5.3 meters wide. You can see that it has a sawtooth or denticulated pattern. And we have remains from the uh, Middle Bronze Age, the Late Bronze Age. In the Late Bronze Age, they're continuing to use the Middle Bronze Age structures, by the way. And then the um, Iron Age one period, and then the Early Roman period, and then the Byzantine period. So it's walls on top of walls and all different types of orientation. And then we get to attempt to figure it all out and, and piece together what happened there uh, in antiquity. So you have the large wall encircling the site, which is about five acres in size in, um, um, in its entirety inside the wall. Jericho would have been about nine acres I about three acres. So just to give you an idea of the, the size, those are storage rooms that you're looking at from the period of the, of the tabernacle. And inside those storage rooms, we find multiple collared rim jars, pithoid, the typical Israelite collared rim jar. And this is, to my knowledge, the only site in Israel that has storage rooms encircling the perimeter of the fortification wall which makes perfect sense because when people came to, to Shiloh, they wanted to tithe, this is commanded, and they could not go to tabernacle.org and make a secure online donation. They had to bring commodity. And uh, I think that's, that's what we're seeing here. The purple building at the bottom is what we are eager to finish this summer. I need one more corner to be sure that it is what it appears to be. But that building is the exact dimensions of the Mishkan as given to us in the Bible. And around this building, we have ceramic palm granites, a motif of the tabernacle, 
that we are excavating. We have a demolished altar um, adjacent to this, and we have a cleared destruction matrix as well. So this will be our top priority this summer is to finish the excavation of this building. And incidentally, it orients perfectly east-west. And if you go due east of it to the perimeter wall, you will find a favisa. And I'll show you some pictures of that in, uh, in just a moment. So Scott, let me just stop you for a second. Please. Are you telling all of us right now that there is a possibility that you found the tabernacle. Yes. Um, I published an article before the dig began on four possible locations for the Mishkan at Shiloh. Aaron, I never thought that <laughs> in field H1, if I had thought it, I would have written it. Um, I never thought we were going to uncover something like this. Um, I had written that I thought that I agreed with Hans Kier and Israel Finkelstein that the summit was the most likely location for the Mishkan although Finkelstein's chronology would be different. I agreed with him on the location. Um, but to my enormous surprise, as we began to unearth this first wall, wall 10, um, of course, it caught my eye that it was east-west and that it was um, from the right period, the period of uh, Samuel and Eli and Hannah and so forth. And then as the, the perpendicular walls began to emerge and we began to see that symmetry of that two to one symmetry take place, then I was extremely taken by this. I assumed when we left Israel in, in when did I leave? July 2019, that I would be back in a few months and we would be able to answer this question. So unfortunately, we have not been able to. So Aaron, the answer, is, short answer is a guarded yes, because I can't be positive until I have the final corner. If I have the final corner, then you tell me if it's not the tabernacle, then what is it? It's the exact dimensions given in the Bible, and it has all of this cultic material around it. And when people visit Shiloh today and they point them to the northern platform, there is nothing on the northern platform. Um, you know, I hate to run a, a tour guide's business, but there's nothing there that points to the Mishkan. So, uh, yes. All right. You didn't cut me off, so I guess I'm okay. Um, the next screen you're looking at is a, a drone shot. And, you know, we've only been flying drones for about eight years. And the first time we did, everyone stopped working and got their cameras out to take pictures of this drone. And of course, now it's a daily thing that we're taking hundreds of drone photos each day. We use photogrammatic software and we crunch those images to build 3D models and so forth. But uh, when one begins a new excavation, one must establish an alphanumeric grid. And so this gives you an idea of the grid. What I wanted to see was the inside of the fortification and to connect the Danish and the, the Bar Ilan excavations uh, to connect them and to give a larger global understanding of what was going on and to see on top of the wall and outside the wall. And again, to my um, pleasant surprise, we uncovered something that was more than we anticipated. Now, on this screen, if you look over to the far right, you'll see some archaeological squares. Do you see those? All right, that is area D. Area D is where the Fabisa was, and in this sacred deposit on top of the wall, outside the wall, and just inside the wall. Oh, can you, this... can you, you point it out with your cursor? Yes, I'm sorry, right here. Oh, okay. Thank you. And th this was excavated by Finkelstein, and um, he noted that there were thousands of uh, bones, and the bones were all kosher, all sacrificial, um, and there are thousands of pieces of late Bronze Age pottery, bones and pottery. And the late bronze, for a ceramicist like me, um, you know, it's not, it's not difficult to, to date late Bronze Age pottery. Um, regrettably, Finkelstein did not do carbon dating on, on the bones. What we're going to do this summer is we're going to remove those balks. Do you see the balks here that were left? Normally, archaeologically, you leave a balk, which is a meter wide on the north and on the east. We are going to remove these balks from, let's see, that would be 
well, 40 years ago almost. Um, and within those balks, we expect to have new bone material, new ceramic material, and hopefully good carbon material that we can date as well with our newer, better technology that, uh, that we have. Now, Finkelstein noted that two thirds of these bones were from the right side of the animal and one third was from the left side of the animal. Now, we're talking thousands of bones, so this cannot be an anomaly. Now, he never gave any interpretation to that, so I will interpret it for you. Um, that is Leviticus 7. The, the right side of the animal is the priest's portion, and there is no other explanation for a disproportionate number, two to one um, bones. So we are planning to do a lot of work on these bones and the analysis of them. I think you're looking at evidence of the biblical sacrificial system. And that is due east of our large building, by the way. With my cursor, I'm going to show you where the building is that I'm talking about. Right here, right here, right here. This is the possible location of the Mishkan. Now, if you go due east of there, look what you run into. And that's about a 30 or 40 second walk. 50 seconds or whatever, less than a minute to walk over there and to dump these sacred bones. And the pottery vessels are all mendable as if they are drink offerings or libations, which is rare for us to have all these mendable vessels. So the vessel itself has value. You pour the wine out as part of the sacrificial process, and then you break the vessel itself as a gift or as an offering uh, to God. So the bone deposit, the storage rooms, the building, the palm granites, the, the demolished altar, um, all of these inductively begin to paint a picture of what was happening uh, in antiquity at ancient Shiloh. Now, one thing I'll point out before I leave this slide is this is our headquarters. And underneath this tent is a wet sifting station which is the greatest that has ever been built. It is state of the art. And we are the only team to ever, now Starkey back at, believe it or not at Lachish back in the 1930s, James Starkey actually was using wet sifting. And then he was so far ahead of his time that no one even emulated and, and followed what he was doing. And it was completely forgotten. And I didn't even know that until you know, recent research brought this up. I thought we had, you know, we're following what the Temple Mount Sifting Project had done. We just brought it into the field so that we could get the material in situ. So we excavate 100% of the material and wet sift it in situ so that we know where those, where those finds are coming from. And so right here is where the, the magic is made. We built our own water tower. Now, after you know three years of not working, I imagine we, we're going to have a lot of repairs that we have to do when we arrive uh, this summer. Okay, moving on. You can see a close-up now inside those storage rooms. Here is the glacis. This The glacis is the earthen embankment that surrounds the site and protects the fortification wall. It keeps an enemy from digging out underneath the fortification wall and undermining it, like Cyrus's men did in Babylon. And um, this had a about two meters of mud brick that was on top of the glossy inside and outside the wall. So obviously there was originally a large mud brick superstructure atop the Middle Bronze Age wall, which is, if you know what, what happened at Jericho, it'd be almost identical to what happened at Jericho the stone walls at Jericho did not collapse. It was the mud brick superstructure. And uh, because they're still standing today at Jericho, we have the same thing at, uh, at Shiloh. And when, I, when I'm talking about collared rim jars coming out of the ground, this is what they look like. These are the, the, the very large pithoi storage jars. And we have countless numbers of these that we excavate. We do our best to, to reconstruct them, to gather all the sherds. Uh, Leah Traumer at REL University uh, does our restoration for us. We start it when we're in the field and then Leah works on it throughout the year when, when I'm back in the US. But this is that telltale sign. Now, some of you probably have read widely in archeology span and know this, but others maybe not. When, when you have collared rim jars, and you have an absence of pig bones, which we have 0% pig bones in this stratum. In the previous stratum, we have 
and then you have uh, four room houses at a side. We only have one quasi four room house at Shiloh, but Shiloh is an exception. I'll get to that in a minute. But at a typical side in the Highlands, if you have four room houses, collard rim jars, and no pig bones, guess what you have? Meet your ancestors. You have Israelites. Those are the telltale ethnic indicators. Now, here's how I picture the storage rooms. They, they, these units are clustered together in units of, of three as they encircle the site. We don't know if they go the entire perimeter around the site or if it's just on the northern uh, side where our building would be. But again, you can see the building here. More, we have more of it now than in that drawing. But if this were happening, where are you storing all your, your tithes? Right here where I'm showing you inside these storage rooms is where they're being stored. And then this is where the, the Mishkan is at uh, Shiloh. So the name of this course, the Nexus, how, how humans encountered God or how we encountered the, the sacred. I mean, you're looking at this long before Jerusalem. Um, it was at Shiloh. And there's a short video here, which I'll, I'll skip for the sake of time. Um, if you come volunteer with us on a dig, you'll have to get up very early. I try to get Aaron out this early and haven't succeeded yet, but he usually shows up a little bit later. Um, this is what it looks like when we get to the site, and it is a glorious thing. You can see a beehive of activity. We're fortunate to have a large uh, team. Uh, normally, we have 11 universities this year. I'm not sure what the final numbers are going to look like, but uh, a number of universities and volunteers, including the Danish Biblical Archaeology Society and, um, and other groups and institutes that volunteer, groups that come out for a day. And um, we have uh, visitors, of course, come by all day long, tour groups. And this is very different for us because for all those years, 21 years at Kirby del Marcatia, we never had a visitor. <laughs> you know, we were so far out in the middle of nowhere and in the wild, wild west that uh, this has been a, a big adjustment for us to have visitors and we're like animals at the zoo. They come by and throw peanuts to us as they, as they walk by and we, we try to perform. Um, we have bathrooms, we have running water, we have 24 seven security. So it's a very different ball game than we had uh, dealt with for many years at uh, in my theater. This is Gary, who is um, my co-director, Gary Byers. And uh, this is Abigail Levitt, who now uh, lives in Israel doing her PhD at uh, Ariel University, and Abigail is the uh, assistant director. This is one of our many peer reviewed publications. So when we excavate something important like ceramic palm granites, we then publish those so that it's entered into the academic record and it goes through peer review. And this is important to me because, you know, when we publish these things, I don't want people saying, oh, that's just, that's just stripling. That's just, you know, he's a crazy evangelical. He believes the Bible and he's trying to prove the Bible um, because nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, we just want to uncover what happened in ancient times. It happens to coincide very nicely with the biblical text. But I mean, if it didn't, it's not like we would try to make it fit something that it didn't fit. Uh, the, the, the bones from the right side of the animal, for example, I mean, give me another explanation of that, and I would love to, to entertain it. But uh, this is that ceramic palm granite I was mentioning, a very important find in, in the country. I think it was voted the number two find in Israel in 2018. And these are only found in Israel at uh, Levitical sites, by the way. The palm granite, you may have heard, has 613 seeds. Um, I've tried to count them, and I always lose track. I, I think it's probably accurate, and those are the number of commandments in the Hebrew Bible, and you know, some some would see a correlation there. Um, that may be true. It, it likely also has to do with fecundity or the potential for reproduction. I mean, your your crops have to be fertile, your animals have to be fertile, your wives have to be fertile. If not, you don't survive. Um, or as I like to say, you can count the number of seeds in a palm granite, but you can't count the number of palm granites in a seed. This is the only sacred fruit that goes into the presence of God, into the Holy of Holies. Uh, the priest carries these, these palm granites on the hem of his garment along with bells. And um, 
so it is something special. Solomon's temple was later adorned with 200 uh, pomegranates as well. And here is one that the Danish had, had excavated, but they had misidentified. Because we have people working with us in uh, Denmark, I was able to have someone go to the museum in Denmark and to pull this, and we were able to publish it uh, as well. Now, these two young men are standing on top of the glacis. They're from King's College, and uh, they're smiling very big because they've done something good. You can see the red mud brick that they've excavated through, and they're standing on the glacis. It's about a 35-degree slope. Uh, they're getting ice cream that day, and that's what they're celebrating. You get ice cream, or at least I buy the ice cream, if you do something really good. And so what they did was they exposed the glacis in that section. Now, within the glacis itself, we have Middle Bronze II or MB2 pottery embedded in the glacis. So that gives us a good foundational date for the fortification system being built um, uh, in MB3, because the earlier MB2 pottery is embedded in the, in the glacis. And Scott, just to clarify, Glassy is part of the fortifications of ancient cities, and they were actually a method of making it hard for enemy armies up to the wall of the city. Yes, and a second purpose would be to protect the foundation of the wall, because an enemy could dig out the wall of the foundation of the wall and cause the whole thing to collapse. So this, this made it where the enemy could not do that, and then, yes, you're right, because of the 35 degree slope, then they've got to fight gravity to run up into the city, whereas you've got the high ground to protect your city. Yeah, good point. And you can see here the portion of the glossy that we have excavated, the part that we hope to excavate this summer, what the fortification wall looks like as it encircles the, uh, the site. And uh, some of the drawings, again, I told you that there was a mud brick superstructure that sat atop the wall. And here you can see those fallen bricks, how they are on top of the glossy. It's inside and outside. I'm only showing the outside here. But we've got later Byzantine terrace walls. We've got early Roman or second temple period walls, um, you know, Canaanite period walls, and then Israelite period walls. So it's, uh, again, like the world's greatest jigsaw puzzle. And uh, here you see me sitting on the glacis. And uh, look at the size of those stones behind me. <laughs> those are massive. So that's the wall is, is very substantial. And uh, this is a BBC team that is, uh, is interviewing me for a documentary that already aired in Israel. They sent me this link that it aired. They interviewed uh, Finkelstein. They interviewed me, about his, his uh, new dig. And so. Uh, they had about 40 minutes of Finkelstein and about four minutes of me. But uh, anyway, at least we got a chance to give our, our two cents worth uh, in the uh, BBC documentary. Um, there is a lot of interest in Shiloh. And almost every day there are media on site, you know, that I'm talking with um, because the stakes are high. Um, do you have a reliable biblical text? And I can't think of a more pertinent issue in question, because if you do, then there are ramifications from that. And uh, you can see one of the altar horns in secondary usage. This is part of a Byzantine church that later became a mosque. But um, when you have something like this, it was part of an earlier structure. We have since found other altar horns. You can see another one here built into a wall. You can see a beautiful example here, just a couple of meters from that previous one. And this is right next to that large building that we were looking at. We are currently having this tested. Again, I haven't had access to my material since I left the country in 2019. They let me in on a journalist visa a few months ago and I was able to get a few things to get tested and start the process when I was there. But we are testing the surface of this also for residues and see if we can learn more about it. But it's clearly an altar horn. And then here's a possible third one from a destruction matrix. Not, not so sure about this one. This is from our square AG30. We had a clear sealed locus. See this plastered material? And uh, here's a bench. And so it's, it's plastered. For us, this is like gold because that means that what, what is underneath it has not been disturbed since ancient times. 
it's sealed by this plastered floor. Um, so getting underneath the plastered floor, of course, we should be able to have very reliable dates. So I told our team, if we do have clean pottery and uh, carbon material, I anticipate the date is going to be about 1075 uh, BC. And so sure enough, when we got underneath it, we did have a destruction level. And you can see it's very significant. I, I think, by the way, that you're looking here at the Philistine destruction of Shiloh. It is hinted at in the biblical text, but it never comes out and says that the Philistines destroyed Shiloh. Psalm 78 hints at it, 1 Samuel 4 hints at it. Um, Finkelstein had found in Area C a destruction layer that he tentatively said could have dated to that. I think he dated it to 1050. So here's ours. We did get good carbon dates. They came back uh, 1060 plus or minus 30. And so I had estimated 1075. So it was right exactly where I anticipated um, that it would be. And this is Lane Rittmeyer, who's our uh, architect, the, the famous Lane Rittmeyer, the world's leading expert on the Temple Mount. And it's Lane who, um, after we dig everything, creates our uh, world-class drawings. Uh, he's here with Dr. Mark Hassler. They're discussing an opening in the wall. Like, why do we have this opening in the wall, um, this symmetrical type opening? Is this possibly an indication of a secondary gate, what we would in archaeology call a postern gate at ancient Shiloh. I still don't know the answer to that, but uh, maybe this year I'll, I'll be able to answer it. But we went to the inside of the wall, 5.3 meters on the inside, and went down to bedrock, and we found an even earlier burn layer. So long before Joshua and the Israelites arrived, um, hundreds of years before the city had already been burned at one, uh, one point you can see. And so if there is a secondary opening here, not saying this is the main gate of Shiloh, but we may have a secondary opening here. And nearby, we have some socket stones and other reasons to believe that maybe it is. You can see those sockets. Perhaps we have found the northern approach road, people coming from the north, coming to worship. This may have been how they came and accessed uh, the site. If you're not from Israel or you're not working in this area, then just to quickly point out, this is the modern community of Shiloh, uh, maybe 4,000 residents there at the most uh, today. And um, of course, expanded during the Trump years, I think that may have come to a screeching halt uh, under the new American administration and its influence. Uh, and here's the Tower Museum at, at Shiloh. So as I said, about five acres inside the walled fortification. Here is a look at the building that we've been discussing, what those dimensions would be, how it would fit. And um, if you, again, walk due east, then you would run into that uh, Fabisa. If I'm right in this, this paradigm, and um, you know, I'm adding nuances that I don't know for sure at this point, I'm, but I see no reason to be coy about it. it, it it appears to be this at this point. We had to remove a massive terrace that was here to get down to this level. But um, if, if I am correct in this hypothesis, then this area right here would be the Holy of Holies. And so, you know, for a young guy starting out doing this type of work, being interested in archaeology, being interested in biblical history, um, I had high expectations, but even I did not expect that I would be excavating the Holy of Holies. And so, when I am, I have to tell you, there's a sense of awe. I mean, I think like Psalm 110, uh, 102, 14, um, blessed are those who love your dust and cherish your stones. I mean, this is, this is something very significant and very meaningful to me and to my team. And we feel uh, honored to be able to do it. I had mentioned that you have a second Mishnaic source. The Zevaim 14.6 uh, also states that below was a house of stone and above were hangings and this was the resting place. So um, basically what you're getting from these two Mishnahic sources is that you have a combination um, building tent. So the building of stone platform and then a superstructure tent, if you will. So maybe they're still preserving the Mishkan idea of a tent. We don't have houses from this time period, except for one. Once this building is built is when the first houses appears, I guess what I should say. 
prior to that, the Mishkan's there for a long time and we have no houses. So I, I think what's going on, although we have pottery, you know, so clearly they're there. I think they're living in tents. And the idea that how can we live in houses when God is still living in a tent, that is a very biblical idea. And so it's only after there is a permanent structure that's built that then we begin to see permanent structures uh, built at Shiloh, one in Area C in particular, which is outside the fortification wall, which suggests that it's prior to the Philistine arrival, because what Israelite in his right mind would build his house outside the fortification wall uh, once Philistines have arrived in the land. Now, what I did is I took the dimensions of the Mishkan, and we excavated this church at uh, El Makatir, and I superimposed the dimensions of the tabernacle on that church, and I was blown away. It was a perfect fit. So you have, again, the concept. I did not realize that early Christians were building their worship centers on the pattern of the tabernacle with a, again ratios of two to one of holy to most holy and if you've studied churches a little bit there's five of them at Shiloh you can see from the Byzantine period you have the Bema right here and um, and the, a staircase that would lead up and so forth only the priest would go past this into this point the holy of holies if you will and then in the nave, we would see this as sort of the most holy place. I only point that out to say that there was a commonality of how Christians and Jews were seeing the use of sacred space. Um, and even we have very early records where synagogues and churches were indistinguishable from each other. We have early Christians passing Jewish synagogues and making the sign of the cross when they when they passed them, because they were almost indistinguishable architecturally. Now, of course, there are indicators that we as archaeologists can use to determine. Sometimes you've got a synagogue that is rebuilt as a church that is later rebuilt as a mosque. <laughs> we track all of the loci and, of course, the colors and the texture and the elevation so that we can accurately recreate. We also stabilize and um, refurbish all the the vulnerable walls when we excavate them. And uh, this is sort of what a, a top plan would look like or a cross section rather would look like as we're tracking the different loci and what pottery and what objects are coming from which area. Through wet sifting, we find things like this. This is a bula or a part of a bula at least. And if you look carefully over here, you can see the fingerprint of an ancient Israelite on here. And that's really cool. You know, you're talking about real people, real places, real events, and there's somebody's there's somebody's fingerprint. It has some Egyptian hieroglyphic characters uh, on it. And uh, we are finding five times as many bula, five times as many scarabs as we used to find because of wet sifting. And so when I went through the Danish and Finkelstein dump piles, we found more scarabs in their dump pile than they published in the reports. Now, they weren't throwing them away on purpose. They just simply, they're hard to spot. They're small. You know, a bula looks like just a piece of dirt, a scarab covered in dirt. You know, it's very hard to, to, to know. So now we have found for every one that they published, we found four and a half, I think it is, in their dumps. The, the, the dumps were full of material. On the other hand, some of you know that we did a project with the the dump at Mount Ival and that Aaron and I uh, partnered on doing. And then my team did the wet sifting aspect of it. Uh, Zertal's dump was very clean in comparison to the Shiloh dumps. But even with that, um, there was a lot that he missed. You just simply cannot get everything without wet sifting. And uh, there were some very important objects that, that uh, they unintentionally missed. So you can see Finkelstein's, the Danish scarabs, and then the Finkelstein scarabs that they published. And as I said, we found many more in the dump than they, and they lose their value once they're in the dump. If you get them in context, you can use them for dating and they've got great archeological value. Now we of course are recovering all of these. Um, and we have two more that I need to add to this list. And this is only in 12 seasons of, ex, uh, 12 weeks of excavation. So we're averaging about one per week whereas they were averaging about one per season. And this is what wet sifting will do. This is the Tutmose of the third scarab from Shiloh. You can see his cartouche here with his name in the middle. 
the, okay. the icon of Sorry, sorry to disturb. I, I've noticed that you found many scarabs from the Hyksos period, uh, yes. which, which is, which is, if, if, if I, I don't know if you agree with that chronology, is attributed to the time of Joseph. Um, how, how is that that, that that you find so much of these scarabs? And I, I also understand that Hyksos uh, material is very rare. Yeah, the scarabs are normally Hyksos are very common. Uh, scarabs. You're talking 16th and 15th dynasty. Um, you know, I would not link it to Joseph. I think Joseph is is earlier. But um, why we have so many? They clearly are ruling. You know, they these Canaanite city states are not Canaanite city states. The Hyksos are Egyptian. They're foreign rulers, but they're ruling Egypt, and they they exercise complete control over these sites in Canaan. So it's a mistake for us to think about. Canaanite city-states as being different. It's part of Egypt, just like the American colonies were part of Great Britain until 1776. And so when the Israelites exit Egypt and they come into Canaan, they're fighting Egyptians, okay? <laughs> and the Amarna letters prove that. So the idea that they're performing some sort of genocide is repulsive. Of course, they're not. These are people who have been trying to kill them for hundreds of years. These are people who've had them enslaved for hundreds of years. You got me on my soapbox there. Here's some half scarabs. This one is Hyksos. Um, they would use scarabs to impress vessels like wet clay and other things to mark it. From Second Temple period, we have a lot of coins. Um, this one is a coin of Agrippa the First. We uh, we find about let's see, let me get you the right number here. Ten coins a week, something like that. Um, and and the the Finkelstein dump pile is full of coins. <laughs> um, so we're talking about every ruler. Uh, if some of you may be re readers of the New Testament, I'm not sure, but every ruler mentioned in the New Testament, we have his coin uh, at Shiloh, including Agrippa I. We track everything, the floral material, the final material, the flint, the soil samples from each square and each locus, so that we can scientifically uh, test it. And so uh, you can see a summary of our first three seasons. I won't read through that since I've already uh, talk to you about it, but I think we're right at an hour and um, probably at a good stopping point. So Aaron, I think I'm ready to um, open for Q&A. Okay, so uh, thank you. Um, before we go into Q&A, if you can uh, uh, share with us um, uh, some information about uh, the uh, interesting discovery at Mount Ebal. Uh, we just uh, heard Ralph Hawkins uh, last week, talk about uh, the excavations of Adam Zertal and his findings. Uh, and now we have a, a very exciting finding uh, from, re from your recent uh, wet sifting project. So if you can just share with us just a few words about the wet sifting project and uh, what we are about to hear about this week. Okay, sure. Can I go ahead and stop sharing my yes. Uh, PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. Hi, I can see y'all now. Um, Aaron and I were theorizing this would have been 2018, I think. Um, maybe at the end of the dig, Aaron, I think you were there and maybe Shy and a couple of other folks came by to visit me at Shiloh at the end of the uh, 2018 season. And even though the end, the last day of the dig is a very difficult day for me, but uh, when I have friends like this drop by, you know, one has to stop and drink tea. And uh, as we were sitting around the table, you know, we were talking about what a shame it was that we could not do additional archaeological work at Ibad because there were problems. I mean, the scarabs have gone missing, the carbon date, carbon material has gone missing, and now we can't date that. And you know, there were just different pending issues. Um, and somebody said, I, you know, they would never give a license to, to an Israeli, you know, it's too sensitive, the spot, uh, you know, we would need a foreigner to do this. Of course, I was the only foreigner sitting at the table. And so, you know, sort of all, all the eyes, all the eyes were on me and probably they meant to say someone who was, you know, willing to risk his life and his reputation and career too. But 
Um, but as they were all looking at me, um, I said, well, I'll tell you what, I have an idea and that's, you know, why don't we wet sift the dump? That would not be an archeological excavation. So we wouldn't need a license, but based on our results from wet sifting here, I can tell you the dump is gonna be loaded with stuff that can shed new, new light, you know? So make a long story short, it was, to, for it to happen, there were so many obstacles, you know, so many things that would have to fall into place politically and financially. And um, ultimately, every one of those things did fall into place. And, um, you know, Aaron and I were really sort of the, the key players from the beginning that um, it was Aaron's vision to continue Zertal's research and to try to bring some, not closure, but illumination to because he was never able to do a final publication. And then it was my passion because the Highland sites, the conquest period in the Highland sites. So those two kind of came together and with Aaron's you know, local influence and then with my archeological team, uh, we were able to pull this off and to wet sift about 30% of uh, Zertal's dump. And so 70% is still there but we, um, at a nearby site, were able to erect and build a provisional wet sifting station. And then my team, you know, just they're like trained warriors um, and literally trained archaeologically and every other way. I mean, they'll walk on glass, you know, to, to make this happen. And, uh, you know, we just went at it. And among the many things that we found, about 300 pieces of diagnostic pottery that they had missed and uh, about 100 objects, um, flints, and other things that were important. Seeds, because we have no seeds, no faunal study from Zertal, and so now we do. We were able to, through flotation, to extract seeds, so you know, we had a, a lot of material, but most importantly was a fo small folded lead tablet, and uh, we have been able to recover text from that tablet through uh, tomographic scanning and um, we are going to be presenting the results of that this Thursday at a press conference in Houston. And uh, then you will be hearing it and seeing it all over the media after that. I predict a feeding frenzy. Um, and we have a, a very ancient Hebrew script and text. Wow. Okay. Uh, so more, more on that uh, on the Thursday press. Uh, um, uh, event and uh, I'm so sorry we can't share more more of that information with you, but I'm sure that you'll be very happy to hear uh, what the, that uh, text is. Uh, so if if you guys have any questions about uh, the Shiloh uh, lecture, uh, any questions, please feel free to uh, open your mic and uh, address the question. Do I need to mute myself, Aaron, or am I good? Keep it on. I'll ask, I'll ask uh, one question while people are thinking. Um, the, uh, what, what's your dream uh, of finding uh, uh, in that uh, structure uh, that, that might be the tabernacle? What, what is your dream of what, what uh, finding do you do you dream of? Well, there could be I mean, the, the the curtains of the tabernacle were perishable. They're made of animal skin, so I'm not expecting them to have survived in the wet highlands. But the the biblical text does talk about metal sockets, you know, uh, bronze sockets, silver sockets, accoutrements like clasps that would have held the the tabernacle. Those things were made of metal. And it is possible, the, the, the Ark was captured at this point at the Battle of Afek. And if the Philistines indeed came and destroyed Shiloh, then, and if they burned it, I mean, we have a burn layer right there on this building. It's very possible that there are going to be some metal, be they bronze, be they silver, be they gold, because all three are mentioned in the biblical text. We could have accoutrements of the tabernacle. Um, you know, the pomegranates are an example, but I'm talking about the medical, me, metal. The Philistines, if they saw some, I'm sure they grabbed them because they had value. But, you know, so usually something gets missed, things get missed, and we archaeologists get to clean up the, the leftovers. Do you agree that uh, the, uh, 
alter and mount ball ceased to to, uh, to, to, to to be the holy site the central holy site and it was moved to Shiloh yes uh, here's what I see the chronology um, 1400 there is a ceremony at at uh, Ival after that ceremony the tabernacle is erected at Shiloh with the the Ark of the Covenant. So from about 1400 to about 1250, yeah, from about 1400 to 1250, so about 150 years, we have clear evidence at Shiloh, that bone deposit and the pottery and clear evidence of an occupation at Shiloh and nothing at Ibad during that time. Around 1250 is when you get evidence of the rectangular altar that Ralph talked about last week that's on top of the round altar. So that round altar was built around 1400. It was a one-time ceremony. There's a small amount of pottery. There's some cultic objects. That, that altar is there. Maybe it's visited or venerated. But around 1250, the rectangular altar to venerate it. And from there on, for about 100 years at Ival, you have evidence cultic evidence. But guess what happens at Shiloh? Now, nobody, I haven't published this yet, but I'll just tell you right now, we kind of have a gap at Shiloh from about 1250 to 1150. So that bone deposit plays out and we got this little gap. And then around 1150, Ival is buried intentionally. Okay. A mantle is placed on top of this to use Zerthal's term around 1150. And guess what happens at Shiloh? The activity returns. And so now we've got Eli and Hannah and Elkanah and Samuel, and this whole period begins to play out. Now, this is where archaeology is so fascinating because the only new things we're learning about the biblical text, we're learning from archaeology. You know, there's these things aren't, aren't told. I'm just telling you what I'm finding as an archaeologist, having studied and worked at and excavated both of these sites. Ival, 1400, round altar built, one-time ceremony, tabernacle goes to Shiloh for 150 years, activity ceases at Shiloh, altar built at Ival, operates for 100 years, goes out of operation, intentionally covered, and then it picks back up at Shiloh. Why they did that? Who knows? You know, you're going from Ephraim to Manasseh to Ephraim to Manasseh. You know, either way, you're staying in that Ephraim Manasseh nexus, but I just find it very fascinating. Thank you. I think we have a question at the chat box. Someone asked. Do I access it or are you going to read it? Uh, I can read it to you. Uh, you mentioned two Mishnah references besides uh, Zevachim 14.6. What was the other? Uh, it's from the Seder Olan, and I don't have it right in front of me, but I can uh, I can uh, put it in the text box here in a little bit, but it's Seder Olan. Okay. If anybody has a question on the mic, please uh, feel free. Okay. I think we're, uh, we're good to go. Um, anything to summarize, Scott? Well, first, uh, or lastly, I guess in closing, let me thank you for um, hosting the course, for putting this together. I think it's a fascinating topic, and I appreciate all those who are taking the course and their interest in learning more, and I would invite them to stay engaged. Uh, obviously, this week, we've got big news coming out, um, but then this summer uh, at Shiloh, they can follow us at digshiloh.org. Wonderful, and I, and I want to thank you for being so um, courageous. Uh, for doing everything you're doing, despite uh, the criticism from the uh, minimalists and the those those that are trying to bash the historicity of the Bible and are trying to use, um, I want to I want to say fake news, fake archaeology, uh, to to uh, to bash the Bible and to bash the archaeological evidence that is there uh, to to for us to see and discover, uh, and so we're we're all looking forward. Uh, to seeing the results from this uh, current dig in May uh, and how uh, the, the issue of the possible tabernacle uh, develops uh, and what evidence will be found there. 
And uh, again, this week is going to be very exciting because of your very important work and the wet sifting of the Ibal uh, um, dump. So we're all waiting to hear that. And so uh, please, uh, we, will all, we will send you a link uh, on, uh, I believe it's going to be on uh, Wednesday, uh, a link to watch the, uh, the press conference about the lead tablet on Thursday. Uh, it's going to be um, at 10, 10 a.m. Uh, Central Time US in Houston. And Scott is going to present the, the Hebrew text that was found inside the lead tablet in full. And guys, it's going to be amazing. So uh, we're all looking forward to that. And, um, and uh, Scott, we need to talk about doing a tour to Israel again, now that uh, tourism is opening. I think Joshua's altar is going to become a very important place to visit for many people after this coming Thursday. So thank you all for attending. And uh, next week, we're going to have a, a fascinating so a session about Bet El. I think that Scott uh, left Bet El on the side, but it's also mentioned in the book of Judges that the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant were at Bet El as well. Uh, so uh, the, unfortunately, as I, as I know, the, cult, the, the worshiping site of Bet El is still in dispute exactly where it is. And so we're going to hear about that next week. See you all next week. And I hope you guys are enjoying this course. And uh, we'll see you next week. So shalom from Samaria.